So a lot of little factoids first. Um, IDEA is online. So this is something new this year that you're going to be completing it online instead of the paper form that we collect because there will be a lot faster response for us as faculty members because actually we haven't even gotten the ones from last fall yet. So online is better. But please remember to do it before the end of May 1st because that's the last day. Okay, we have, uh, I, did, I never made the announcement about who was the Digital Commons winner for the last few times. So for Threads of Resistance, it was Brianna Plasse. We thank her very much for that. And for David Tremble, it was Lauren Cicero. And um, for both of these speakers, I sent them the uh, ones that won, plus some other ones for um, the Threads one. So Pamela Weeks was really very pleased. She said, the, the students got it, what I was trying to say, so she was thrilled with that. And David sent a really um, a nice extended response back saying that um, it was a complex lecture. He was trying to put, put in what should have been six lectures with all of the different trade agreements and so on. I know it was tough for some of you guys to get all of it onto one page. So he congratulated Lauren for getting it onto like one page. Out. So I'm going to forward it sure. to you so that you have this nice comment for your work so on do you have that say, particular yeah. summary. Yeah. So for feminism, it's yeah. okay. um, Marley so, got it for that. So she's going to be sending that to me and I can send it so over to Kitty right. Commons. No, and what is Courtney this Brown called? For I don't know. Um, Many more of you chose feminism is that for skinheads. So, um, Maybe, yeah. Was, yeah. But okay. Courtney's been getting check yeah, buses all the way along, so this was her time to shine. So we'll continue to have selected summaries for the digital commons. And uh, the one for today, okay, no. if you write short summaries for each one of the student papers, except if you were one of the speakers, you don't have to write a summary on your own. I'm, I'm going to be picking for each student summary okay. as well. So put it into the Dropbox by May 9th. That's the, the deadline for that. You can put it in sooner, of course, but um, May 9th is the last day. Don't forget to do it. And um, the ones that you just handed in, I'll have them in a box, like you know that snow day when you're coming up to my office to pick them up. Um, I'll have it in a box by what day? I don't know. What is the last day you're going to be on campus? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little too soon. Um, so middle of next week, like maybe Wednesday of next week. These are the ones that you just handed in. Wait, what? Will you still be around Wednesday of next week? Yeah, yeah. we have exams on the third. Can you come by later than Wednesday? Yes, yes. <laughs> but it's just when I have to have them out by, you know. Um, Wednesday is good. <laughs> I drag them around all over the place. Um, okay, so we'll put them in by Wednesday. Exam next Thursday. Tonight there's a speaker. If you want to go to hear another talk, this is by um, a fellow named Reza Koyi. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. I'll have to get it before I announce it tonight. But he is um, a person who's had 30 years in the fashion industry. He has had a store in Manhattan, and after 9-11, he decided he didn't want a store anymore, but that he'd rather rep um, some pretty high-end brands. So that's what he does these days. Um, Judy Kim has met him, because the store that she's interning at, where are you, Judy? Right there. Right there. So was, uh, he, he reps <laughs> to your store. Yeah, I saw him the other day, too, at the New York show. OK. Um, so he's really excited to have him. Yeah, I think he's going to have a lot of interesting information. So we're speaking tonight at 7 p.m. in Chafee, 277. And I know it's, uh, my TMB 240 class, you can get extra credit if you come. And um, I think Dr. Hamill is giving extra credit too. So please do show up. <coughs> then at, we're going to have four student speakers today. But at the end of the day, um, if you are a junior or a senior, we have this exit survey that we give every year. You don't have to put your name on it but it asks you some questions about your experience here at URI. 
plus some factoids that we think you should know, like the difference between a knit and a woven. <laughs> so um, it, it won't take you very long to do it, so stick around after the last speaker. Okay, so four speakers today. Um, the first one is Renee Mason, who is a TMD major, and um, she was, was a transfer here. She spent some time in Illinois at the Illinois Institute of Art, and she also attended CCRI and came to URI um, from there. So she is speaking on sumptuary laws, and I wore my scarf <laughs> just to commemorate that. So let's... Great. We're good. <coughs> you have water. Okay. Thanks. So this is the mic. And you should be all set. Okay. <coughs> Okay, so um, my topic is sumptuary laws in early modern England. And I chose this mainly because obviously I'm interested in textiles and historic fashion. But we kind of also decided that um, there weren't a lot of TMD courses that covered this topic. Um, so what are sumptuary laws? They're basically laws that um, regulate consumption. So this can be applied to um, food, drug, um, alcohol, but we're going to obviously be talking about how it applies to apparel. And um, there's basically two reasons we see sumptuary laws being used in England. The first being um, a restraining of extravagance or luxury, really to reinforce morals and regulate social hierarchy. And the second reason is um, a way to balance trade by limiting the import of goods. So first, before I started, I just wanted to give some brief history before I dove in. Um, so this is a cotton textile fragment. It was found at an excavation in Egypt, and it was dated to the 14th century. So it's really clear from um, the pattern and the dyes used in the colors that it um, was made in India. But that's thousands of miles away from Egypt. So when we think of our world today, um, we think of it as being quite globalized in terms of retail and fashion, merchandising, etc. cetera. Um, but in reality, this has been happening for centuries. So when you think of the journey of a piece of cloth, um, do keep this in mind. So sumptuary laws have been in use um, since the reign of Edward III all the way back into the Middle Ages. For this lecture, I'm just going to be ranging from the 16th century to when the Tudors are in power. So, for example, um, Henry VIII or Elizabeth I are big players in this, um, all the way until the 18th century to when um, Parliament is really pushing for sumptuary law. So from the 12th century to the 18th century, um, the wool industry is one of England's most important economic resources. And also at this time, India has a thriving cotton industry. And of course, we all know that um, China is heavily trading silk, which is becoming increasingly popular um, in the courts of Europe. So considering all these commodities being traded, we see the emergence of joint stock companies. So for example, um, the East India Company from England or the Verenade Ost Indisch Company, abbreviated to VOC, also known as the Dutch East India Company. And um, these are mainly backed by the Crown, which means that they can finance really large trade missions and um, also share the risk of international trade. Um, so with trade comes wealthy um, merchants and a rising middle class which means at this time the monarchy is quite worried about um, you know, their future and how much power and um, wealth they're going to actually have. So the first types of sumptuary laws, like I mentioned, are concerned with restraining extravagance. Um, and dress at this time is used to identify social rank. So if our dress is becoming <coughs> homogeneous, um, how are we to tell who has more wealth or power? So these laws will dictate things like type of fabric allowed to be used, um, colors, trims, or even the amount of fabric allowed to be used in a garment. And this will all depend on um, rank or occupation. 
So just for example, there are many different um, acts of apparel, all by many different rulers. This is just a small example. Um, and the things that we see are, um, you know, gold or silver and cloth, different embroidery, different colors of velvet, um, taffeta or satin or silk. And for each of these rules, there's going to be exceptions on the other side for who is allowed to wear them. So obviously the king and queen, those who are close to the crown, um, you know, how wealthy you are. Oh, cut off some of my slide. Um, and then there's also this interesting rule where um, if you are a servant who rep represents someone in this um, exception, you are supposed to be participating in luxury items because you really are a reflection of your master. So how are we even going to enforce sumptuary laws? Because there are two people that are mainly concerned with them, the first being those um, who are wealthy, like I just mentioned, and the second being the clergy, because they're quite concerned with the morals of England. And, um, you know, they believe that um, the more we participate in wearing luxury items, the more we're going to be um, greedy and it'll lead to the sin of pride. So um, th these are the most common ways to enforce it through the clergy or maybe your, even your own neighbor. It could be someone who turns you in. <coughs> it is really debatable on whether that actually happens. But um, the next way to enforce it are going to be um, state appointed agents known as um, the justices of the peace. And um, the most common punishment is forfeiture of the item you're wearing and then a fine, which um, really does vary depending on the year the act is in place, the ruler at the time, or maybe even your own local justice of the peace is concerned with lining his own pockets. So um, there's also another interesting rule where um, if you are someone who is able to afford the item that was forfeited, you're allowed to sue for ownership, and half of this money does go towards the crown. So it's a way to regulate morals, <coughs> keep social hierarchy in check, and then also um, really tax their citizens. So there are very few cases that are documented of what happens um, after someone is caught, but we do know the case of a Richard Walwian, who was a soldier in the English army at the time under the rule of Henry VIII. Um, so we're talking about early 1500s here. And Richard was caught wearing a very monstrous and outrageous great pair of plunderhosen. And plunderhosen are basically a pair of pants, um, there's an example here, that are um, above the knee and they have longitudinal slits in them where expensive fabric, usually silk, shows through. So I know I mentioned before some of the laws dictated how many or how much fabric was able to be used in a garment. So your normal pair of hose or men's pants usually have about um, 3.5 yards of fabric in them, which is usually made of wool. Um, plunder hosen take about 14 yards of fabric. Um, so his pants were taken from him and just put on display to shame him. And um, because not only was he wearing a very large quantity um, of fabric, he was probably wearing silk as well. So the next reason we really see sumptuary laws enacted are because fabrics being imported at this time really become a threat to the English wool industry. So um, obviously wool, cotton, silk, linen, these are extremely different fabrics. Um, and you're gonna be choosing them depending on what you wanna use them for. So when silk is being imported, um, if you're someone who's under the exception and allowed to wear it, you're probably going to be choosing that over wool. And when um, cotton starts being heavily imported um, around the turn of the 16th century, early 1700s, if you're a laborer, lower class, you're probably going to choose cotton over wool, especially in the summer months because it's much more comfortable. And the cottons that are coming in are printed and dyed. So you can wash it and that doesn't actually fade. So there's many benefits to the many different income levels and much more options. Unless you're someone who works in the wool industry, of course. So we do see two proclamations where this is mentioned. One from 1574, the next from 1588, so these are both under Elizabeth I, that mention um, 
this danger of having more imports than exports, and also this need for protection to their own wool industry. There's also a proclamation from 1571 that dictates that all males over the age of six are um, supposed to wear a wool cap on Sundays or be fined. So um, I, during the 17th century, 1.2 million pieces of cloth are being imported by the VOC or EIC, which I had mentioned earlier. Um, and the cotton at this time that's being imported um, are mainly calico cottons from the Calicut um, area of southwestern India. And India becomes very good at um, customizing their designs depending on who their customer is. So India themselves and um, or the Asian markets really enjoy a red background or dark background, like the lower um, example, or um, where they notice that a Northern Europe really enjoys um, a light background or a white background with floral print on it. Um, and even at the time surrounding um, 15, oh, excuse me, 1660 to 1670, the EIC does pay Charles II, who's King of England at the time, mm -hmm. to wear a calico waistcoat, um, really to stimulate the market. So this idea of influencers um, that we have today really isn't actually a new one. So um, by the year 1700, English mills say enough, and Parliament finally um, passes the Calico Act of 1700, which prohibits the import of cotton into England. This wasn't necessarily effective because there was no punishment for selling cotton in England. So this means that um, if I'm in this industry, I'm probably going to just have someone smuggle cotton in for me, and then I'm going to sell it and not get in trouble. So next, 1721, Parliament passes a second, much stricter act, known as the Calico Act of 1721. Um, and it really does prohibit both the import, sale, and wearing of um, cotton in England. So after the banning of cotton, there are movements to shame people, mostly women, for wearing it. Um, for example, this is a um, ballad on a pamphlet that was being passed around um, and it's known as the Spitafields Ballad because the area of Spitafields is actually a concentrated area in East London of weavers who were out of work as a result of all of these imports. So they said, um, by the East we're oppressed, by the South we're distressed, though at peace with our neighboring nations. Yet if steps not be made to recover our trade, it will wear each sufferer's patience. For both sinners and saints are so full of complaints of tricks that have lately <coughs> been played them that they ex cause the South Sea or their coffee and tea for not drowning each calico madame. So um, you can read this next line to yourself if you want. But um, <laughs> the banning of cotton, um, this is much more effective. But the events that actually follow are known, known as a calico crisis because women are actually publicly attacked for wearing cotton or calico. So we do know of one victim. Her name was Dorothy Orwell. Um, and she actually states in court she was attacked by a weaver named Peter Cornelius. And she states, um, he cut and pulled off her gown um, and petticoat and threatened her with vile language and left her naked in a field. Um, so because of course Calico was banned at this time, it was her fault. Um, and then we do have a statement from the other side, from a weaver, um, who does state that um, these petite disturbances are properly with the women themselves, which precede the foolish fancy of some. So he mentions this idea of foolish fancy because it was believed at the time, you know, cotton is banned. So if you're a woman wearing a printed cotton gown, you're just trying to confuse us and you're trying to be much more high class than you actually are. So this becomes so bad that um, actually the Weavers Guild does condemn attacking women. So the banning of cotton actually won't be lifted for another two decades. And as we know from um, actually last week's presentation, England does eventually um, colonize India, which means that England can just <coughs> take the raw cotton being grown in India, ship it to their domestic mills, and they can them themselves produce the cotton that's so popular at the time. 
So sumptuary laws really do illuminate many things during their hundreds of years of reign. Um, they expose this vulnerability of the upper class um, during times of social and economic change, where they felt like um, they needed a much more rigid social rank um, in response to this rising middle class. And then the next thing that sumptuary laws do illuminate is um, this idea that we're still struggling with today, which is whether or not to um, protect our domestic industries. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions for Renee? <coughs> Thank you. And next we're going to Alexi. Oh, Yaron, right? Oh, okay, you. so she is um, from Bolivia originally. And I feel like I'm short. What? She is uh, oh, yeah. going to be speaking about uh, a leader there, <laughs> Evo Morales. So I'm going to put this on. Oh, yeah. you get Presentation three. You're supposed to put this on and then that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Very unorganized, you can see how many mm -hmm. things I have on here. You can just type it at the top. Okay, we're gonna get <coughs> oh, yeah. Okay. We did that. Okay. Play from start. Okay. Perfect. All right. So you can see your notes okay. right there too. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, hi everyone. I'm Alexi. Um, I chose to do Evo Morales, who is the president, current president of Bolivia right now. He's serving his fourth term, um, which is the longest that a president has ever been elected. Um, so my title is President of Bolivia Wearing Bolivia, and I hope that makes sense at the end of it. So um, some people, if you don't know where Bolivia is, it's in South America. Um, it has two capitals, La Paz and Sucre, and it's the, the largest city is Santa Cruz. Um, the languages spoken are Spanish, and there's 36 indigenous languages, and two of those being um, Aymara and Quechua, which are the most common ones used by indigenous people that live in the cities. Aymara is the indigenous nation um, from the Andes in western Bolivia, and that is where Evo Morales is from. So the Bolivian flag is the red, yellow, and green, and then we have the Wifala Aymara flag, which is also represents Bolivia and the indigenous people. When you, if you ever do visit Bolivia at the airports or even just um, some local tourist shops, they will always sell both flags um, just because they have a lot of pride in the indigenous um, people that are from there. So the early life of Evo Morales, he was born as Juan Evo Morales, um, October 26, 1959. Um, he's one of seven children to two poor coca gro growers, so the coca leaf is very popular in Bolivia. Um, it's used for healing methods, for teas, if you have a bad stomach ache. Um, it's just a really good natural cure that everybody still uses till this day. Even guards um, of some houses and um, also even maids or just housekeepers, they all just chew it just to keep them awake. It's just a natural medicine that they use for many different uses. Um, he graduated high school and then joined the Bolivian military after um, helping his parents um, with their coca growing. 
And after the military, he continued to work for his family um, for their coca business. Um, his path to presidency, um, Evo Morales is a founder of, a of MAS, the Movimiento al Socialismo. It's the movement towards socialism called leftist. And um, he paved the way, that paved the way for Evo Morales to become part of the political scene of Bolivia because he was the first indigenous um, person to get involved into politics and he won his legislative seat in 1995. He tried running against their current um, president at the time, Gonzalo Sanchez de la Zoda in 2002, but he did not win. Then he tried running again in 2005, and he won and became the first indigenous elected president of Bolivia. So the next slide I'm gonna show you is why I chose Evo for this um, presentation for politics and fashion. Something that stands out to me about Evo is that he is seen and photographed in this certain sweater that you're going to see multiple times. He wears it during his tours when he visits different countries, different continents. And it stood out to me, not only because I'm from there and I hear the news from there, but because most world leaders, they wear suits and ties, button down shirts, trousers, even just some slacks. But um, he chose to go a different route um, in the beginning of his presidency. So even when I go into Google, I just type in Evo Morales sweater. There's this certain sweater, it's made out of wool. The one that he has is alpaca wool. Um, it can be retailed for this amount, but in Bolivia you can honestly buy it for eight dollars, eight US dollars. And um, you can see on the bottom, he's seen wearing it multiple times, and those are not all in the same day. Um, the sweater um, is sold by the Punto Blanco company, and they call it the symbol of the president. Um, when Evo started wearing the chompa, which is sweater in Spanish, um, customers would go into Punto Blanco's store in downtown La Paz and just specifically ask for the sweater because their president was wearing it, it was affordable, and they wanted to be like him and dress like him if they could. So in 2006, um, up to 300 sweaters a day were selling in eight of the Punto Blanco stores in La Paz. And um, the owner of the, the manager of the store says, our president uses this sweater, so they want to wear it too which is something that makes sense to me if we could all dress like everyone, all celebrities at an affordable price or even world leaders. Um, it's something that I think maybe we would do. So here are some photos of Ava wearing this sweater in multiple occasions. Um, the first one at the top is when he was meeting with Chinese president Hu Jin, Jintao. Um, as you can see, the president of China is wearing um, dark suit, uh, tie, button-up shirt, very well cleaned, and Avo just has the regular sweater, a leather jacket, and just some slacks. Um, to me, looking at these, it just, it's a statement that he's trying to come across and just say, you know, I am a world leader too, but I don't have to dress like all of you guys to show my power. I, he was, he's on his fourth term right now, and he's been continuously elected every term. So his, his country appreciates him for the things that he's doing for them, not by the way that he dresses. Um, the bottom picture is when Evo met uh, African leader Tabao um, Mbeki. And you can see again there, gray, gray um, suit, blaze um, tie, button down shirt. And then at the top, when he met Spain's King Juan Carlos in Madrid in 2006. Um, the impact of this sweater was everyone was selling it, the factories were making it, people were making replicas of it. As you can see, the girl in the corner, it's not exactly like Avos, but they're making replicas. And the photo on the top in the middle, they're called Cholitas, which are indigenous women. and. I believe there they're having a small parade or just a march and they're selling his sweater but in honor they have a ribbon around it. They're, it's not just on the floor that they're selling it for just some coins or anything, they're selling it with pride.
um, in the bottom photos you can see it being made in the manufacturing um, companies. <coughs> So in the New York Times, I was reading an article, it's from 2006, about Ava Morales' fashion choices. Um, so these are two quotes from different reporters. We saw his dress as an act of sincerity, said Raul Valda, the owner of the Punto Blanco textile company, which is re reproducing the sweater Mr. Morales wore in Europe. He doesn't feel the need to dress up like someone else. He goes as he is. Why should he put on an Armani? And the second quote, is there no one who might lend Mr. Morales a dark suit? Asked a writer for the paper, which also noted that pullovers like that are given away to the poor in Spain. Reforma in Mexico wrote that the sweater was the garment of discord far from official protocol. So the first one, why should he put on an Armani? He shouldn't. In my opinion, he's doing a great job at the time, and it's true, why should he put on an Armani? It is a good question, but I believe that he's proven why. He represents Bolivia in his indigenous way, and he has pride in his um, culture and where he comes from. And in the next couple slides, you will see how he evolved into not taking the advice of the fashion choices that the public would want him to take, but he made it his own style. So is there no one who might lend Mr. Morales a dark suit? Um, he got the hint and then came the blazer. Mm -hmm. So these photos are more recent. They're after 2013. Um, as you can see, he is with other world leaders in the front and in the top. I believe one is of Cuba and one is of Chile. And he put a twist on his blazer. The designer of it, her name is Beatrice, she was asked to design his um, blazer during his, um, I think it was his first presidency, his inauguration. So he finally took the advice and he gave it a Bolivian flair. So the design on it, the embroidered on the collar, is called Aguayo, and it can be seen on a lot of different clothes, but I thought it was interesting that he decided to not have buttons on it at all, the certain that without the folded over collar. And so the Bolivian inspired blazer, um, at the top you can see Evo shaking hands with the King Philip during his visit to Spain in March 2018. This was just recently, so he's still wearing this specific blazer. I'm sure he has multiple versions of it, the same, maybe three blues, three blacks, three browns, but he's gotten the hint, and I haven't seen him wear the sweater in a very long time. Um, in 2015, um, that's him on the bottom visiting um, Salvador Sanchez with the president of Colombia and Juan Manuel Santos. Um, and there again, they're wearing suits, ties. He's not wearing the tie yet. Hopefully he sticks to it. Um, but he is wearing his dark blazers. So wearing Bolivia, the reason for that title is because he is sticking to his roots and as to why he, ch he is choosing to wear and represent his indigenous ancestry um, culture. He's not just going to put on an Armani suit just because it's designer. He is representing Bolivia and he enjoys wearing Bolivia. So the top photos are the world famous Argentinian soccer player Messi when he visits Bolivia and he gives Evo a signed jersey and in return Evo gives him a traditional Bolivian wool poncho. Um, they exchange, he tries it on. And at the bottom photo, it's Jeremy Brown, British liberal Democrat politician, when he visited Bolivia and he got the gift of a poncho as well. And as I did more research, this became a trend and almost expected whenever a world leader was to visit Bolivia. So next we have um, some celebrities, actor Sean Penn, when he visited Bolivia, <coughs> he was also welcomed with a poncho. And at the bottom, we have actor Jude Law when he visited Bolivia, and he received the poncho as well. So when 
Evo Morales is visiting other people in other countries, continents, other world leaders, going for different reasons. He's going to represent Bolivia and wear Bolivia. And I believe that now he's going to make a statement. And whenever people visit Bolivia, he wants them to wear Bolivia as well. And here you see their ponchos, President Evo Morales and his vice president, Alvaro Garcia Linera. And that's it. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. My family, we call it aguayo. Um, some people just say embroidered, um, but I could spell it out for you later. <laughs> now because everybody's going on. Aguayo, um, A-G. Oh, I say with the G. A-W, A-W-U, A, Aguayo. A-W-A-Y-U. A-W-A-Y-U. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Very interesting. Yes, thank you. Would you like some water? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right, oh, so yes. you're still attached there. So um, um, we're staying in South America. Okay. Maybe if you just exit it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Maybe home and then open. Oh, right there. No problem. Just your pocket. Thanks. It's fun to say it like that. Did you know that um, when they charge the U.S. people visas? Yeah, they charged me too, by the way. As an American citizen? Mm -hmm. When he first started doing that, he was making you buy the sweater. Oh, I didn't I wish know I got that. a chance to tell you. I think he oh. stopped doing it, but when he first did it, but he was like, that's everyone, all the Americans say, why do I have to pay $200? And he's like, because you're buying the sweater. And he that's hilarious. <laughs> no, I, 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 know, I, wish I, I just went in um, last December for Christmas, and I had to get a visa, too. And they made you pay? My mom, when my mom went, she got her dual citizenship just so oh, yeah. she would You should get it. yours, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, our third speaker is um, Amar Kofakari, and he is from Peru originally, although he's been in this country for many years. He's a graduate student in the program, just starting this semester, and probably this is the first talk you've given in a really long time. So he's going to be speaking on um, arpilleras, which are some um, acts of, they started out as acts of resistance, so we'll hear more about them from him. Thank you. Thanks. So um, I did my presentation about arpilleras. Um, I'm just going to get this ready here. I can't quite see it. Anyway. Yeah. So um, arpilleras literally means burlap. Hang on, I'm on the wrong slide here. All right, there we go. Arpillera literally means burlap. It is used as a backing material to create a vibrant cloth collage speaking about uh, political repression. The first ones are credited with being made in Chile upon the beginning of Augusto Pinochet's military dictatorship in 1973, and that went till 1990. In Peru, an armed conflict began between the communist Shining Path guerrillas and the state. And that went from 1980 to 2001 and occasionally ongoing still. These similar conditions facilitated the transfer of this technique slash social and economic movement against political violence amongst uh, civil society throughout Latin America and the world. I'm getting mixed up with this. Hang on, how do I see the notes? I'm trying to read, but when I click on it, I lose the whole. No, but the problem is I'm on this one, but I want to read the notes from this one, and I'm seeing the notes to the next one. 
That's mm. really confusing because when I'm here, I see those notes. Yeah. But when I go to the next one, I don't see those notes anymore. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I go here. So I go here, then I lose the whole. Yeah. You know okay. what I mean? Okay. Sorry, everybody. I thought it was going to. I do want to swap this place. Maybe just go end the slideshow and then try to do. I could just do it like this. And just, you know, so I I'm just gonna do it like. I'm just gonna do it like this because then I can read. Oh yeah. Oh. Um, I just want to do. I just want to do play from start. I think I think it's different. Right there, I can see it. Okay. I don't know. When I go to here, it moves. So go back again. Click to. No, that's for when you. Okay. That's not <coughs> if I am okay. going to Google, um, I have it on Google Slides. Why do I? Why does it make me? Here and I want to read this. There's got to be a better. It's saying next slide, but I want to see the notes for the current slide. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. What about swap displays? I don't know. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay. I just have to sign into my Google and then I could look at it. Thank you. Do you have internet? You have internet? Oh, great. Thanks. That'll be easier. I just figured it. Oh, I can undo that. Sorry. This is where but I would have had to start. So nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, presenter view, is that, where was I? I don't remember. Play from start, was it? <coughs> I think I could have played from start and I think it was in there. Yeah, but we go in here, look, it's over here. We need to get to that screen to undo that. We need to go into here. How do I get the mouse? Can you, can you see the mouse here? Oh, yeah. It says swap sledge on that screen. Why is it over there?
Okay, I can see it in those here. We can get that. So I can get I think you gotta drag this mouse to get over. Can I see the? I just want to see. I just want to see the mouse. Is it, there it is. I just gotta get right. Swap. Oh man. That was something. Okay. Sorry everybody. Okay, let's start over. Okay, so I did this presentation about RTS. So arpillera literally means burlap. It is used as a backing material to create a vibrant cloth collage speaking out about political repression. The first ones were made in Chile during um, August, Augusto Pinochet's dictatorship from 1973 to 1990. In Peru, there was an armed conflict that began between the communist Shining Path and the state, which went from 1980 to 2001, but occasionally happens still. These similar conditions facilitated the transfer of this technique uh, and movement against political violence amongst civil society through Latin America and the world. These two neighboring countries of South America, Peru and Chile, suffered dissimilar fates. Peru from a leftist guerrilla civil war and Chile from a right-wing military dictatorship. Both of these situations arose from one common thread throughout Latin America, the legacy of the Spanish conquest the institution of capitalist exploitation and the resulting rebellions of civil society. So, the Spanish conquest in Peru and Chile began in 1532. The natives were forced to pay tax to Spain. African slaves <coughs> were brought to many parts of Latin America. Here we have a brief breakdown of the caste racial organization under the Spanish crown. For almost a century after the Republican Wars of the early 1800s were fought against Spain for the liberation of Latin America, conservatives and liberals fought to reverse or to deepen the social and political changes unleashed by those rebellions. For the next couple hundred years, many external forces would continue to fuel the conflicts battled by conservatives and liberals. During the Cold War, many countries became a proxy battlefield between the US and Russia. After that, the war on drugs fueled these divisions right up to the current day. Who makes arpilleras? One very important facet was the women's groups that would meet and share their common experiences of political violence through this art. Many were grieving the pain of one or more loved ones, mostly men, who had vanished and were presumed dead. These groups continued to meet and produce arpilleras during the long decades of repression. After the military government caught on to the production of arpilleras, more repression towards these groups ensued. Arpillera groups' production and export were driven underground. Under the protection of the Catholic Church, emboldened by liberation theology and human rights doctrines, uh, so here we have a, a map of the Americas, so you can kind of see where Peru and Chile are. Um, arpilleras, how are they made? Arpilleras are made with simple recycled cloth materials sewn onto a burlap backing. Techniques include sewing, crochet, needlepoint, applique, and collage. Many arpilleras were made out of the clothes of the disappeared, and for this reason hold a lot of weight as a tool of resistance. The women began making these not thinking of themselves as artists, more as a way to express emotional pain and make a small household income. The finished product was refined over time, often with guidance from trained artists, nonprofit workshops, and by different exporters. <coughs> Who sells arpilleras? Um, because of the political nature of this movement during the time, they couldn't just set up in public and sell these protest images, especially after the military, military government discovered arpilleras being taken out of the country in someone's luggage at the airport. Arpillera groups had to find ways, people they trusted, exiled dissidents living abroad. This was not a capitalist marketing, and the creativity used to achieve this in such a repressive environment was impressive. 
as the years of dictatorship dragged on, the invisible network of people who supported this resistance movement grew and grew. If we think about how many people this government turned against it, this art formed, formed served to guarantee the memory of why people were so against it. This type of reinforcement has the power to chip away at a dictatorship little by little, year by year, undermining its power. Who buys Arbilleras? There are a few cases in the, wor in the world's handmade textiles market where the work shapes the demand. In many cases, market-savvy designs are brought in from the West to be made by women with their own ancient traditional textile knowledge and culture. The cheap production and business done with fair trade principles can help economically, but it doesn't help to reinforce these ancient textile traditions in most cases, which further undermines the cultural self-esteem of these people when faced with mounting assimilative pressures. After World War II, a new emphasis on human rights and democracy by the West created an environment favorable to the development of international market channels through solidarity with the victims of political <coughs> violence. This emphasis on human rights nurtured a solid and sustained movement of solidarity art, and this movement has coexisted with fair trade for many decades. Here we have um, <coughs> the Arpillera makers. The interaction between Arpillera makers and global Arpillera consumers is very interesting. The consumers here are not shaping the product. These Arpilleras, as visual artworks, often describe scenes of violence, poverty, and inequality. It takes a certain type of empathetic human to support this rather than industrial production. The art is educating and uplifting the consumer, as is the consumer being uplifted, supporting the artist. Um, this is textile collage, similar to Arpillera techniques on the right. It's a Hmong story cloth. On the left is um, a contemporary Arpillera made from the, by the Maya Quiche Zapatista movement in Chiapas, Mexico. The Hmong story cloth was made during Vietnam era. Here we have two more arpilleras from Ecuador on your left and Brazil on your right. All these art forms share one thing in common, political violence from the eyes and hands of local women. Um, please note these are not arpilleras. The style and subject matter relates to a long history of folk painting in Peru. This tradition is much older and yet visually similar to the arpillera art movements. It is these similarities that assisted the Arpillera movement to be adopted in Peru. The piece on the right is titled Uncuy and was recently mistaken in Peru as supporting terrorism um, because it was being displayed in a local art gallery and brought the full attention of the press, politicians, and police. You can see that it has written text in Spanish. On the upper left-hand corner, there's, you can't, it's kind of pixelated, but there's a handwritten message there. The message says, um, I'll read it quickly, it's, the title is Uncuy, which in Quechua means sickness. So they wrote, uh, carrying machine guns, knives, explosives, and a red flag with non-matching uniforms, these intrusive stranger elements arrived in our town, taking the inhabitants out of each house one by one under threat of death. They forced us to hold a community <laughs> meeting to listen to their false promises of social justice and better standards of living. We are humble, innocent, Quechua-speaking people with our own traditional ideology. We didn't understand the promises and speeches of these strangers. Confused, we asked for protection from our old mountain gods. Peru as a nation in the 20th century was comparable to apartheid South Africa, with extreme poverty, small middle class, and a minority criollo elite that still run things from the coast today. Because much of the indigenous majority was not literate in Spanish, this important population was not given full voting rights until the 1979 Constitution. It is obvious then that Peruvian people had and continue to have valid frustrations with the ruling elite political class. The, Spanish, the Spaniard caste system we saw earlier is still alive in essence. No amount of laws can criminalize racism. The valid critiques, dreams, and ambitions of the majority of Peruvians were swept away by the political violence begun by the Shining Path movement. 
Nowadays, anyone protesting racism, exclusion, or, contaminate, or contaminative natural resource projects is labeled a terrorist, as we saw with the previous folk paintings. With the return of most of Latin America to democracy, the secretive underground nature of the production and sale of arpilleras is now gone. Gone also is that brief window where the art was shaping the consumers. Once again, the consumer calls the shots. The arpillera groups in both Chile and Peru are attempting to make what sells. Here we see a typical beach scene next to some nativity Christmas stockings. The one thing that doesn't change is the economic benefit for impoverished women and families that these things produce. Um, contemporary arpilleras have become almost 3D with a lot of texture and raised surfaces. The materials have changed using a lot of bright synthetic clothes and yarn, or synthetic cloth and yarn. The art has come a long way from its humble beginnings as a way to communicate political violence and repression with whatever materials people could find on hand. Hopefully they won't have to communicate anything but happiness in the future. Thank you. It's so weird. Do we have it, one of these in the collection? Oh, you do? Cool. Yeah. It put itself back together. It's so weird. The notes came back into. I don't know where they went. Okay. Oh, back. <laughs> Thank you for your So our last speaker is um, Alexandra Belain, who has uh, come to us from New Jersey, and uh, she studied abroad in Florence. She uh, she's a TMB major, graduating, and she's going. She has a general business mind, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. So today I will be discussing a fashion leader comparison with Michelle Obama and Melania Trump. Um, a fashion leader has, this is a quote that I got from the book, The Second Skin. The important prerequisites were generally personal attractiveness, impeccable taste, and a social life accorded, um, a social life that afforded the individual opportunities to be filmed or photographed. A fashion leader is someone who is admired, inspires fashion, and is important in society. Celebrities, politicians, models, and most people in the public eye like Michelle and Melania are considered fashion leaders. Both ladies acquire most of the characteristics stated by the quote um, and each have considered what kind of statement their outfits are expressing when they step out of the house or travel to different countries. First I'll be discussing Michelle Obama's history. Um, her four main initiatives as first lady was to become a role model for women an advocate, and an advocate for healthy families, service members, and their families higher education and international adolescent girls education. She tells the press that first she's Malia and Sasha's mom but before motherhood and a wife she was a lawyer. Michelle studied sociology and African-American studies at Princeton University and post-graduation Michelle went to Harvard Law School. Um, promptly after graduation in 1988 um, she joined a law, a law, for, law firm in Chicago where she met Barack Obama. She started to work within communities and neighborhoods in Chicago and created an AmeriCorps, and created an AmeriCorps program that prepares youths for public service. In 2010, as First Lady, she created the Let's Move movement um, to bring people together nationwide to address childhood obesity. The goal of this program was to um, solve childhood obesity epidemic in the U.S. 
In 2010, Michelle launched the Re Reach Higher Initiative, which was an effort to inspire youth across America to take charge of their future by completing education or applying for professional training programs. In 2005, Mr. I mean, 2015, Mr. and Mrs. Obama created the Let's Girls Learn program, which was a U.S. government-wide initiative to aid girls worldwide to go to school and stay in school. Post-presidency, Michelle is still involved in helping her home city of Chicago. Um, now talk about Melania Trump's background. Melania became modeling at age 16 and sought after a degree at the in a university in Slovenia, but put her studies on hold to pursue a modeling career in Milan and Paris. Um, eventually, she moved to New York in 1996. She was featured in high-profile ad campaigns while working with top photographers. Um, Melania was an honorary chairwoman for the Martha, Dance, Martha Graham Dance Company in 2005 and a member of the Police Athletic League that also honored her as the Woman of the Year in 2006. In 2010, Melania was chairwoman of the American Heart Association that raised $1.7 million for research. In 2005, Melania married Donald Trump and had her first child in 2006. Also in 2006, she proudly became a U.S. citizen. She was a successful entrepreneur and launched her own jewelry company uh, collection in April of 2010. During presidency, she attempted to tackle cyberbullying but was instantly criticized by the public because of how her husband behaves negatively. Um, on social media to allegations. Um, sorry. Okay, so first I will be looking at their inaug inauguration day outfits. Um, on the right you'll see Michelle in a Swiss lace design from a Cuban-American designer named um, Isabel Toledo. The designer was in shock when she saw Michelle and her designs because it wasn't planned like it was for Melania, so the designer had no idea. Um, the world was able to see what a great designer this up-and-coming designer was, and Vogue said that she was on the track to becoming a household name. Um, the outfit was complete with a Nino Ricci mohair cardigan underneath the coat with J. Crew gloves and Jimmy Choo pumps. On the left, Melania is dressed in a powder blue suit by the American designer Ralph Lauren. Her outfit is reminiscent of Jackie Kennedy's inaugural outfit in 1961. Her choice of designer was seen as her unspoken commitment to the position of first lady of a nation that wasn't natively hers. Designers had a political voice and conflicting opinions when refusing to dress the incoming first lady. Um, Mark Jacobs said, I'd rather put my energy into helping out those who will be hurt by Trump and his supporters. Tim O. Wieldlin had an emotional response by saying, I just can't. I was 110% the other candidates for very, very specific reasons, and I was brokenhearted about the results. Voluntarily, I will not. And unforgettably, Tom Ford said, she's just not necessarily my image. Um, and then Trump um, fired back with this response talking to a CNN, or a Fox News host. Is it? Oh, it's, it's oh right here. Yeah. Well, oh, we have to, we have okay. Yeah. What these designers that are saying they don't want to dress your wife. She's not, did she even ask Tom Ford? Uh, never asked Tom Ford. Uh, doesn't like Tom Ford, doesn't like his designs. <laughs> Tom Ford is an example. I will not dress the first lady. He was never asked to dress. And Steve Wynn just called me, and he said he thought it was so terrible what Tom Ford said that he threw his clothing out of his Las Vegas hotel. Uh, I'm not a fan of Tom Ford, never had it. So that was quite dramatic, and that's why cyberbullying didn't really work out for her that well. Um, um, on the subject of Tom Ford, whether he was asked to design the inaugura inauguration outfit, he said, in quote, I was asked to dress her quite a few years ago and I declined. She is not necessarily my image, he said. And then further explained, <coughs> even had Hillary won, she wouldn't be wearing my clothes. They're too expensive. They're not artificially expensive. It's how much it costs to make these things. 
I think the first lady has to be has to relate to anybody, which um, Michelle Obama successfully did during her presidency because she was able to relate to everyone through the way she dressed. Um, designers went as far as writing open letters about their voice in society. Sophie Tellet's open letter that I retrieved from Twitter begins by saying, as an independent fashion brand, we consider our voice an expression of our artistic and philosophical needs. And then the letter ends with, um, as one who celebrates a, a celebrates a thrives for divi diversity, individual freedom, and respect for all lifestyles, I will not participate in dressing or associating in any way with the First Lady, referring to Melania. The rhetoric of racism, sexism, and xenophobia unleashed by her husband's presidential campaign are incompatible with the shared values we live by. I encourage my fellow designers to do the same. Integrity is our only true currency. Sophie Tellet wanted to express how designers have a choice and opinion when creating, um, when creating designs, and they shouldn't be threatened by anyone, even the president. Designers use their art, in this case, as a political view and expression. Now I'll talk about um, Melania's, I mean, Michelle's day-to-day -day outfits. Melania's wardrobe was best known for being relatable, affordable, and simple. She wanted to be a role model for the average American, um, American consumer and wear many household names. She has been seen on several occasions wearing J. Crew, but also has worn Jason Wu, Tory Burch, Tom Ford, Marc Jacobs, Ralph Lauren, and many more. Um, in her husband's second tour, term, she used her visibility and importance to bring attention to local designers like Jason Wu. Michelle was a big reason why Wu is a key member in the fashion industry. Um, it was noted that she wore Jason Wu to the President Obama's farewell address in Chicago and to both inauguration balls. This was a sense of closure as of her duties as First Lady. The picture on the right is the First Lady and Jason Wu at the neighborhood inaugural ball. Michelle understood that fashion was a way to create identity for an administration much like Jackie Kennedy and Nancy Reagan. Her wardrobe represented a country her husband and her wanted to lead. Um, it was about the melting pot, the 1% one, the one and the accessible. She mixed in luxury designers like Dior, Gucci, Versace, and Marquesa <laughs> for special events. Um, when Michelle was um, meeting authorities from other countries and greeting them to the U.S. She made an effort to show respect and unity with different cultures when traveling over and greeting presidents. On many different occasions, she's pictured, pictured wearing clothing that is created by designers native to that country she's going to or welcoming into the U.S. For example, she wore Naeem Khan, who is an American, in, um, Indian American designer, to an Indian state dinner to show her recognition and sensitivity towards different cultures, which is the one on the left. Um, after Michelle was seen in the celebratory Indian-themed dress by Khan, he was put on the celebrity radar and went on to dress Beyonce, Carrie Underwood, and Katherine Heigl. In the middle, she is seen wearing Tom Ford, an American designer, who was then based in London when she visited Queen Elizabeth II at Beckham, Beckham, Buckingham Palace. And, when, and on the right, she's wearing Vera Wang, a Chinese-American designer, to greet the Chinese president and his wife. This was an important appearance um, aspect in Obama's presidency because it sh showed a strong and united connection between Michelle and Barack. As a country, it represented us as respectful, humble, and strong. So as a fashion leader, there's always things that outfits that will be regretful. Um, for the most part, Michelle dressed very conservatively and didn't stir up drama with her wardrobe. There are two instances specifically that caused some backlash for her. The picture on the left shows Michelle having tea with Queen Elizabeth II in 2009, wearing quoted a fashion funeral by the New York Post. Um, at tea, she removed her sweater that was undistinguish undistinguishable from any old J. Crew sweater to re reveal a tank top sleeve, which was deemed inappropriate and un um, informal. The backlash was due to the fact that it was too casual, yet. Yeah. Um, in August 2009, the Obama family went vacationing in Arizona and was, went hiking in the Grand Canyon. 
um, Michelle exited Air Force One wearing these shorts that the checkered button down shirt, sneakers, and a pair of shorts. This she quoted as her biggest fashion regret once she saw the pictures. Um, people believe that the First Lady should not bare her legs, but 59% of the Huffing Huffington Post readers voted that she has the right to bare legs. Um, even though the shorts look like J. Crew, no designer has claimed them. Um, so now I'll talk about Melania's day-to-day -day wear. Melania's, um, Melania Trump's first lady fashions are very different from Michelle's due to her fashion background and modeling history. Her appearance is elegant, exotic, and upscale. She's seen mostly wearing high-end European brands like Manolo Blahnik, Dolce & Gabbana, Gucci, and Hervé Pierre. Um, Hervé Pierre has been noted for, as a designer for Washington Wives and helped in designing the inauguration gown. Um, it has been said that Pierre anonymously shops for Trump and mainly buys off the rack. Melania wears her own wardrobe and purchases all her own items. Um, she wears items from her pre-political days as well, but is rarely seen in affordable brands like J. Crew. Um, the white Roxanda dress on the left was worn by Melania when she gave her unforgettable speech at the Republican convention. Um, many have commented that it is interesting to see Melania wearing so many foreign fashions when her husband's stance is buy American, hire American. It is apparent that she has, there's a disconnect between Melania and her husband, husband's views which makes United States seem unorganized and weak. Um, on the right, Melania is seen where, um, seen two weeks after her America First fashion statement at the inauguration, stepping off the Air Force One in a shortened red Givenchy cape dress on Friday. Um, she says America First, but it seems, it is, but is seen in a French designer shortly after her husband made this stance to the public. Um, the day after on that Saturday at the Red Cross Ball, she wore a long hot pink Dior gown, which again is not an American designer. Um, both brands are connected to the conglomerate LVMH, which is one luxury brand that stayed at Trump's towers af after um, election and are openly supporters. Um, Melania has, Melania's way of honoring and visiting countries is definitely different than Michelle. The picture on the left is when President Trump and Melania went to go visit the President and First Lady of China. Uh, Melania wore a dress with Asian-inspired embroidery, embroidery <laughs> designed by Gucci and Dolce & Gabbana, which is not a designer, Chinese designer. Um, in the middle, she's, greeted, she's greeting the South Korean president and wore a pink peplum dress by Ronald Moret, which is a French designer. On the right, Melania is shown wearing a Fendi coat and Manolo Blahniks when she arrived to Tokyo, Japan. Melania appears to not use clothing as a form of diplomacy like Michelle, Jackie Kennedy, and Nancy Reagan. Um, fashion regrets for Melania, there have been several that the internet likes to talk about. Um, th this infamous controversial outfit appeared at her husband's presidential debate. Um, Melania was wearing this Gucci fuchsia blouse with a specific type of bow that corresponded to the video that had surfaced only a few days prior. The public was quick to point out the irony in the choice in the blouse with the video of her husband speaking vulgarly about women to Billy Bush. One of the most memorable fashion mistakes in presidency was when Melania and Donald Trump um, flew to Texas when they were going to get debriefed on the devastations of Hurricane Harvey in Houston. And Melania exits the White House in $1,000 Manolo Blahniks. Um, when they landed in Texas and exited Air Force One, she's pictured wearing a white button down and flat white sneakers. Melania's team tried to deflect the scrutiny of the stilettos by saying, it's sad that we have an active ongoing disaster in Texas and people are worried about her shoes. Um, throughout this fashion analysis, of what makes up a fashion leader, it's safe to say that Michelle Obama is a well, more well-rounded fashion leader than Melania is. She's relatable, fashionable, appropriate, and reflects her democratic views through her dress. 
Michelle dresses accordingly, whether it's to, it was to help at a charity or go to a formal event in London. She's always <coughs> able to find the perfect outfit that spoke positively about her and her husband's stance in the United States. She was, she was and still is an inspiration to many by always being involved, being kind, and successful. Michelle was able to reach many different audiences through her dress, which is what, fa what makes a great fashion leader. She addresses the top 1% and the majority through her fashion, speeches, and attitude. Melania doesn't fit the profile as a fashion model because she doesn't reach all types of people in the United States is made up. She's not openly involved in any organizations and doesn't have a strong platform like Michelle did. Melania also made a first impression to the world by plagiarizing Michelle Obama's speech during the Republican convention, and we haven't heard much from her since. A fashion leader is strong, independent, stylish, has thoughtful outfit choices, and ready to make a difference.